Thanks very much, Fiona. Um, so, uh, so quick, quick note, uh, it is actually the Google Salsa framework, um, <clears throat> not an SLA framework. The framework is about uh, securing artifacts in your CI CD uh, in order to prevent supply chain attacks. And we really applaud uh, Google for attempting to, to take the lead on what we think is largely an unmet need in application security. Um, uh, from our perspective, it's actually the greatest unmet need in application security. So um, we think Google uh, should really be commended for their efforts, but it's also worth noting that the effort that Google has put in here is about one specific part of the SDLC. And if you're looking for, or if you're looking to increase the security of your software supply chain, um, there are some pieces that are out of the Salsa framework scope. So that's what we wanted to talk about here today. Um, but before we get into that, uh, I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about how we got here. Next slide, please. So I don't think it'll shock anyone uh, that many are calling 2021 the year of the software supply chain attack. Uh, there have been more attacks uh, that are more severe than any other year uh, in, in the history of uh, software supply chain attacks. Um, next slide, please. And it goes beyond the headlines. Um, the EU is, uh, is ha excuse me, the European Union Security Organization has uh, demonstrated that the increases are actually up 4X from 2020 to 2021. And uh, Gartner um, is, uh, you mind clicking one more time? Yeah. And Gartner is actually predicting that these changes will continue to, uh, or that the increase will continue to accelerate <clears throat> into 2025 when almost half of organizations um, will have software supply chain attacks occurring uh, in that year. So the point of this is that it's not just headlines. Uh, the, the frequency and the severity is increasing to the point where everybody needs to start thinking about how am I going to protect my software supply chain? Um, and that's where Google Salsa framework comes in. It's an approach to how should we do that because it's an area that many organizations, uh, you know, hadn't really dealt with in the past. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the big change that we think is occurring um, is that in the past, uh, attackers were primarily going after production applications, but now they're actually going after the tools that make up your uh, your uh, your CI/CD pipelines, your software delivery pipelines, and that's a big shift. Um, next slide. So, so why is that happening? One more. So, we think there are three fundamental problems with software supply chain security. The first is a, a visibility issue, and I think it's important to recognize that uh, most security teams are actually not responsible for the key tools that make up the software delivery pipeline. Um, we've done some surveying and in general, about 80% of security teams are not responsible for securing GitHub. They're not responsible for securing Jenkins, JFrog, the cloud environment or infrastructure as code. Uh, the responsibility for, uh, for the security tends to fall with DevOps or with the software development team. And um, while that's great, uh, generally speaking, a software development team is going to set up uh, their software delivery tools with an emphasis based on efficiency and developer agility. And at times that comes at the expense of security. And maybe for good reason, but we think that security needs to find ways to be able to be more part of that conversation to help to determine when and where security uh, should be applied. And ideally, when and where it can be applied in a silent way. So next, please. Um, so the big thing to note here is, is that the tools themselves have become attack vectors. Developers are starting, or excuse me, attackers are starting to shift on attempting to uh, uh, compromise developer accounts as one of the key ways to get into a, a software development lifecycle. And all of the amazing uh, enhancements that we've made in terms of automating DevOps, uh, that, later, that is actually facilitating lateral movement of attackers just as much as it's actually uh, increasing efficiency in our SDLC. So we've created new attack surfaces and we've actually made it easier for attackers to get in one place and then own the entire cycle. And next, and, and lastly, um, there, aren't really, there aren't really tools that are set up to think about security this way. 
Um, there's lots of tools to secure source code in the sense of finding vulnerabilities within it, whether it's a zero day or a CVE. And there's lots of tools out there to try and protect the application in, in the production environment. Um, but what about protecting the software supply chain itself? Um, not a lot exists. So let's go to the next slide. And then uh, the point here is, is that this, uh, our, our software development life cycles are becoming so much easier to own uh, when you break in you know, one particular place. And there's no better example of that than source control management systems. If you think about the evolution of what's been happening in source control management systems, um, you know, 10 years ago, really the only thing that we had in, in our, our repositories was source code. Um, but today we store so much more in our repos uh, that once we're giving an attacker access to that repository, we're giving them the ability to really own the entire SDLC. What do we mean by that? So let's think about something like GitHub Actions. Uh, GitHub Actions are effectively CI/CD configurations. So if I've got access to, to, uh, to GitHub and I can manipulate the actions, then I can, then I can uh, trigger a new build. Uh, we also have infrastructure as code that's being stored in the repository. So not only can I trigger a new build, but I can potentially take that new build and deploy it into production. Um, and then of course, uh, because of the source code, I could tamper with the code. So if I can get in and own uh, a source control management system, you know, I can potentially own the entire SDLC. Next slide, please. And this is where I'll pass it off to Ronan, who's gonna now talk in a little more detail about Google Salsa framework. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so yes, Andrew mentioned uh, all the issues uh, uh, with the software supply chain. Um, and in uh, June uh, uh, this year, uh, almost uh, six months ago, uh, Google announced uh, the Salsa framework. So Salsa is a supply chain level for software art artifacts. Uh, it's basically uh, an end-to-end -end framework for ensuring uh, the integrity uh, of software artifacts uh, through the software supply chain, um, where the goal is to improve the, the state of the industry, uh, especially it is uh, aimed at open source to defend against Sort of this, uh, the most pressing uh, integrity threats, um, as we saw in the in the first slide, um, and basically Salsa is focused more on, on the process of building and shipping code, and not on the content that goes uh, through through the pipeline itself. Uh, so we will um, we will talk about it um, also in this presentation. Um, so it's it, at its basics, uh, the Salsa framework offers uh, uh, four different levels. Uh, of, uh, of Salsa, where uh, the first level, level zero, means that you provide uh, no guarantee at all. Uh, the first level means that the build process is fully scripted, automated, and it generates uh, provenance. Um, the second means that you, uh, in addition to the uh, level one, you also require, uh, uh, you're also using version control and you uh, use a hosted uh, build service to generate uh, the provenance. Uh, at the third level, uh, there are more specific standards that guarantee uh, audit and the integrity uh, of the generated provenance. And in the fourth level, um, mainly it requires uh, two-person reviews uh, and hermetic reproducible builds, uh, which we'll also uh, touch uh, in later slides. Um, so this is sort of a, a more uh, a simple uh, uh, explanation, again, of, of the four different levels. Uh, so level one means basically that you document the build process. Uh, so the example would be unsigned provenance. And uh, the second level means that you will temper resistance in the build service. So this would be if you sign the provenance and you use a hosted uh, source and build. Um, level three means, means that you're extra resistance to some specific threats. So this would be security controls on the host uh, and non-falsible non uh, provenance. And four would be the highest level of transparency, uh, which means a two-party review uh, and hermetic uh, builds. Uh, and then the Salsa framework also offers some kind of a threat model for the uh, software delivery pipeline. Um, we can see it uh, divided into uh, source integrity and build integrity, where the, the, the threats in the, source, in, the, in the source part would be someone submitting bad code, so whether through compromising a developer you know, or compromising the tool, uh, this will be also the, the second threat, the uh, compromise source control. Um, and then we can also see uh, the threats that, uh, that exist uh, in the build phases. Um, we'll elaborate on this more. Um, then the framework sort of takes the, 
takes the, the different uh, stages and divided, divides the requirements into uh, four categories, four broader categories. Source, which is focused on the on the uh, source code management platform and, and the management around the source code. Uh, build, uh, which talks about the build tools that you use. Uh, provenance, which is sort of the, um, the certificate that you will get um, out of the build service that proves the various steps and things that you did uh, or claim that you did uh, in the build. And then common, which would be controls that are uh, relevant to, to all the tools that are used as part of the process. And there is this high level HR that shows you um, what are the requirements that you need to uh, comply with and then which salsa level you are entitled to if you comply uh, with these, um, with these uh, requirements. So uh, let's look at the source, uh, basically uh, for, for uh, requirements. Um, if you're using a source control that is a version control, uh, so this, uh, uh, this entitles uh, Salsa 2, or this is the requirement of Salsa 2. Uh, if, the, if the history can be verified, so each change can be, uh, can be tied to an authenticated user, and we can verify that in this is uh, the contributor, so this would entitle uh, Salsa 3. Uh, and then if the uh, history is retained indefinitely, and if you uh, enforce a two-person reviews, so uh, these are the uh, extra requirements uh, for Salsa level four. Um, but then uh, Salsa also talks about some uh, use cases that would be uh, out of scope um, for the standard. Uh, so the first one would be if uh, two people collude uh, to, to perform some malicious activity, um, meaning they agree to do it. Someone, open, someone opens a pull request, the other person uh, approves it. Um, so here probably the, the first uh, line of defense would be using this privilege and really narrowing the risks uh, against that. Uh, trick reviewer into approving bad code, uh, like we saw recently uh, with the Trojan source uh, attack. Um, so probably the, the best the mitigation here would be to, to have some tool that able to identify it and, and assist reviewers uh, in this process. Uh, reviewers that blindly approve changes, uh, obviously this is not something can happen. Uh, and this is something that can be detected uh, from uh, looking at the activity within the source control. Uh, how long was the pull request open? Um, does it have any comments and things like that? Um, and then we, if we talk about compromise of the entire source, source control system, like for example, if you self host the source control and there's a vulnerability in the version that you use. Um, so this is against, it means that the entire tool is, is controlled by an attacker. Um, and then you can trust the data that comes from the SCM, but uh, commit signing uh, at the developer level could be something that can be used as a mitigation here. Um, and then another uh, issue is uh, admin activity. So, so obviously people have admin access uh, to these tools. And for example, what happens if uh, uh, an, an owner or an admin uh, removes a restriction, pushes code, and then brings uh, these restrictions back? So this is again, something that is uh, not covered here and should be uh, complemented with uh, other tools. Then we move to the core of Salsa, which is the build process, um, which again has various uh, requirements to, to achieve different levels of Salsa in the build tool that you use. For example, do you use a script to do the build? Do you use a, a dedicated service? Is the environment of the build an ephemeral environment? Uh, are, the, are, the, are the builds themselves isolated from each other? Um, is the build parameterless? Um, do you use an, an hermetic build? And uh, finally, there's this notion of reproducible builds, uh, which is not a, a salsa requirement, um, but is a very strong uh, uh, mitigation and, and can be used to, it should be used to, uh, to detect, mitigate uh, this risk of software supply chain. Um, and then as part of the build phase, you need to provide provenance. This is also a basic requirement of salsa. So to achieve level one, you need to, to have some available provenance that you, uh, that you can supply. This provenance is, is basically like a certification that, that describes the different build phases and, and what are the steps that were taken, what, are, what is the code that was built. Um, so according to how strong this uh, provenance is, uh, you can achieve higher levels of salsa. So uh, if it can be authenticated, if it was uh, generated by a service, uh, if it's something that cannot be um, falsified by the build, by the build service uh, users, uh, and if it provides a complete uh, a list of the dependencies uh, and their exact version and it entered uh, to the build process. Um, the framework also describes like what are the uh, 
uh, what is the content that should be uh, within the provenance that uh, uh, is eventually generated. Uh, so obviously identifying the artifacts that were produced, what is the builder, uh, what is the source that built it, what is the entry point uh, that starts uh, the execution. Uh, it has all the build parameters if the build requires one, uh, all the dependencies, uh, and if a reproducible build is possible, so a reproducible build uh, info. Um, and metadata, which is again, another additional requirement and is not um, part of the uh, four level of, of Salsa. Um, so this is a, a, a basic example of Salsa. I won't dive into it, but basically it shows the example uh, of a builder that downloads uh, a Tarda GZ uh, uh, archive that has code in it, extracts it, uh, compiles it, compiles it using make uh, with C flags, and it results with a file uh, with a hash of, uh, of uh, five, six, uh, seven, eight. Uh, so this is an example of how it should look uh, when it is done using the Intoto uh, framework, which is also an open source project um, aimed at, at this uh, specific uh, at this specific uh, issue. Um, so how the scope for, for building provenance would be. Um, so if we if we look at the thread, so if the fork if the build is done from unofficial sources like a fork of a repository, some side branch, unknown tag or something like that, so this would be a TBD in the threads, uh, and basically uh, this should be part uh, of the provenance, and this should be verified as part of the provenance uh, to mitigate against this as well. Um, then uh, if we uh, talk about um, compromise the build, so compromise build tools. So there's again all kinds of scenario. It could be a, an admin of the tool, an owner, a, a cache poisoning, uh, or a, a CV in the tool itself. So if someone uh, 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 compromises the build platform, so again this is uh, uh, this is out of scope. And sort of the the build uh, controls that are described uh, within the framework are are there to uh, make um, to require the use of a, a very strong build system that would be harder uh, to compromise and would be harder to, to gain persistence uh, over. Um, then if we still uh, wanna address this build of, of, a, of a compromised build tools, so a producible build, um, which is the best after effort in the standard would offer uh, some mitigation around that. Because if you can do two, uh, two different builds in two different tools and then compare them against each other, you would detect a, a compromised build tool. The last part of the framework is, uh, is common control. These are the uh, common requirements that should be used uh, in every trusted system that is involved uh, in your software supply chain. So the, the code, the build, uh, and the distribution tool. Um, and sort of the requirements are to have the, the, the system meet some security uh, baseline. This is yet to be determined. Um, have a, a strong access control over these tools, uh, log the access, uh, and use uh, third-party uh, um, multi-factor authentication uh, and minimize the amount of, uh, of administrator and people that have admin access to all these tools. Again, because we saw previously the threats that sort of derive from having users with this uh, high privilege. Um, then if we talk about some um, more issues that are out of scope that are uh, more common, so obviously uh, crypto hash collisions, uh, this would be out of scope for Salsa and and I discussed. Um, also, the framework uh, doesn't look at uh, what goes into the software delivery pipeline, so vulnerability in code uh, or dependency vulnerabilities or infrastructure as code are not explicitly part of the part of the framework, and it should be checked uh, individually. Um, and then the framework um, again focuses on the build and, and code phases, uh, getting the artifacts prepared, and we. Then the missing piece would be uh, looking at the production environment, looking at production exposure and misconfiguration, uh, and continuously checking uh, the provenance that was created uh, in the build phase uh, and, and checking it against uh, the actual pieces of code that are running or distributed um, and make sure that, that it all the line. Um, and then finally, the, the issue of a secret exposure. Uh, so again, not, uh, not mentioned specifically in the standard, but again, could have a major effect uh, on the security uh, of the software supply chain, um, depending on which uh, secret is exposed. But basically, this could be uh, giving access to the tools themselves, uh, bringing back all the uh, threads that we uh, talked about earlier, uh, as well as uh, access to the production, uh, which we talked about here. 
let's uh, move to some uh, Q&A.